Uh, the B stands for Bainet, which is the type of connector it is. It's a, it's a Bainet type of connector, a quick, a quick connect disconnect type of connector, uh, very commonly used in electronics and in, uh, in some amateur radio applications. Here's another piece of 50 ohm coaxial cable fitted with N connectors, N as in November. Uh, it is said that the N stands the N stands for Navy. I don't know whether it actually is. The N connector, uh, both the B and C, and the N connector, the two most common types used on 50 ohm coaxial cable, are both um, 50 ohm constant impedance connectors. Constant impedance means that when you go through the connector. Actually, you have to go through a pair because there's, you know, there's got to be a matching connector. Going through the um, the connector pair, the impedance remains constant. That's what's meant by a constant impedance connector. Um, the N connector, which you see, is much larger, um, is far and away the best 50 ohm connector available. It's the, you know, the premium uh, available. I also have a short piece of 50 ohm cable with a BNC connector on the end of it, and uh, it's just open at the end. That uh, you can see the, uh, the braid and the inner conductor. Um, also on this one, it's, it's particularly noticeable that the metal is black in parts anyway. Actually, that black is silver oxide, which tells us that this connector is silver plated. And um, it, interestingly enough, silver oxide is quite a good conductor, unlike most other oxides, so that um, uh, the black does not necessarily imply a bad connection. However, the inner part, in this particular case of the BNC, um, is in pretty good shape. And the inner pin uh, is gold, and uh, gold doesn't oxidize scarcely at all. Another one to look at. Um, here is a piece of uh, the larger coax. Um, in my notes, I refer mainly to two types of coaxial cable, the small diameter RG58A, which is a military designation, and also to RG213, which is also a military designation. Uh, this one happens to be RG214, uh, which is uh, electrically identical to RG213, except that which is the, also a military um, designation. The sheath the coax uh, this one happens to be RG214, and uh, it has uh, uh, which less is, um, electrically identical to RG213, RG except that which is also made expected as a cost. The sheath, the coax this one happens to be RG214, military surplus, and uh, it has uh, which is, less. Uh, I suppose that I'd have some use for it someday. That's never happened other than today. Um, it's interesting to note that this piece uh, has got um, electrically identical to RG than the end, end, the RG except that which is also made it can be the uh, uh, sheath and uh, the black is going to do that. You'll notice the RG to 14 military surplus along the end of the uh, which is, uh, I suppose the connector that I'd have is some use for it because someday. that's uh, never happened. Air has been kept away from it because this plug is screwed um, into it. It's interesting uh, to note, by all means, uh, to take uh, that off uh, and have a look. Electrically, please do that only with the end. end that's got the chain still attached. Except, except the other end, uh, the chain is in the sheath, and the waggery is to do that. Leave that alone. Except the other end, the chain is commonly used most of the 
your radio do that and leave that alone. She a large name in her case. 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 She a large name in
it happens that there is no energy loss in this reflection at the antenna. There's no energy loss there. There is some energy loss in the reflection here in the matching network because the matching network makes use of inductors and capacitors, and both of them uh, have losses, especially the inductor. So I said early on that really there was no need to have a matching network up here, like a ballon, and that's why. You probably need a matching network anyway, so why bother wasting um, money and time to put a matching ballon up here if there isn't going to be any loss anyway? This is why I say, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a voltage ballon is a useless piece of hardware. But it's easy to understand as far as matching goes, so uh, uh, I guess that's the reason why uh, all of Industry Canada's questions uh, regard a voltage ballon, and none of them have anything to say about the other two types of ballon, both of which are quite useful, if used properly. That's not part of the transceiver, though, right? Pardon? That's not part of the transceiver, the, the network? This here? Yeah. Yes and no. <laughs> I haven't got to that yet. Uh, I just want to pick something up that I um, forgot about. Uh, I've told you that all transmission lines have losses. The, um, uh, the parallel wire line, especially the widely spaced um, open wire line, has the least loss of all and is therefore the most efficient. And the question we come at is, is how do we specify that loss? Well, the loss of all types of transmission lines are specified in terms of decibels of loss per unit length. The unit length is almost always per 100 feet, the loss per 100 feet of cable. Um, but I think any question that shows up in the database uh, expects you to understand the term loss per unit length. Um, I don't think the matter of the decibel has come up anywhere yet, has it? No. I was, no. I was going to say, isn't the decibel a measure of like, auditory volume? Uh, it's a measure of gain or loss, and it's used in both audio and in radio frequency and any almost anywhere else where uh, electricity is involved. All right, then. You're, you're familiar with it probably in audio, are you? Yeah. Yeah, very commonly used in audio. In fact, uh, in audio you'll even see dB meters calibrated and, uh, well, usually centered or somewhere near zero. And that corresponds to zero dB, we use that way, which is actually dBm. Um, corresponds to zero dB and corresponds to one milliwatt. And the same reference is also used in um, uh, for radio frequency. Uh, since uh, explaining the decibel is not part of this particular part of the package, uh, I well, I don't have time to, to look into it anyway but it's, uh, it's relatively easy to handle. Uh, one, th one thing that none of the books um, that I know of explain to you is how to go backwards. Uh, they all tell you how to go from uh, different power levels to the difference expressed in decibels, but none of them tell you how to go the other way, and you can do it. But I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> All right. We also have something to uh, 
be aware of and consider in transmission lines, and that's what's called propagation delay. Um, you know, um, electromagnetic waves. Well, here's a question. How fast do they travel? Were you told? <laughs> See, speed of light. Uh, pardon? Speed of light. Yes. As a matter of fact, light is an electromagnetic wave. The only difference between the radio waves that we know of, anywhere through the frequencies used by amateur radio, and light waves is their frequency or their wavelength. And the product of frequency and wavelength is always the speed of light. That is, you take for 40 meters. Uh, the nominal frequency of 40 meters is 7 megahertz. You multiply those two numbers together and keep your units correct, you'll end up with the speed of light. Although you don't end up with exactly that. In the case of 40 meters, 7 times 40, the number you come up with is 280. Well, actually the number you should come up with would be 300. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, uh, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. Can anybody keep up to that? Sure. <laughs> um, and that's the speed at which radio waves travel, and also light. Light, for example, takes about eight minutes to get to us from the sun. If the sun disappeared like that, we wouldn't even know what happened for eight minutes. And when you start looking at the stars and the like of that, uh, some of the light you see coming from some of the stars uh, started on its way to us millions of years ago. Those places are a long way away. But in a coaxial cable, a transmission line, any kind of transmission line, um, the energy does not travel at the speed of light but at a lesser speed. And that effect is sometimes called propagation delay. Um, another way in which it's uh, expressed is velocity factor. And this is the one you'll find most commonly in books. For instance, um, both of the coaxial cables I've been speaking of tonight uh, have a velocity factor of 66%. This means that the radio waves traveling in that cable move at only 66% of the speed of light, which also means that a wavelength of the cable is only 66% of the wavelength in free space. And incidentally, the, the air that we breathe and live in, um, radio waves travel slightly at a slightly slower speed, but it's um, the difference is less than 1%. It's almost the same. So um, you need to be aware that there, there is a delay in the speed at which the, the energy travels. And in typical coaxial cable, it's 66%. With open wire line and ladder line, it's, uh, if I remember correctly, about 95%, much, much faster. When energy is reflected down the line here um, to avoid damaging our transceiver and to get the energy back up where we want it, we need a matching network to re-reflect that energy back up. But first, there's a relationship between the energy that goes up and the energy that's reflected when there's a mismatch. And incidentally, in practice, uh, there is almost always a mismatch, uh, and sometimes a very big one. 
when waves of any kind travel in opposite directions, not only radio waves, but water waves, sound waves, any kind of wave, a phenomenon known as standing waves occurs. Um, I would love to be able to provide a demonstration of this, and I've been wanting to do so for years, but um, I can write the, the uh, necessary code in any of several programming languages to do that, but right now there's no, uh, I don't know of any um, software that will, software, computer program, however you want to describe it, that will translate this into um, a picture on the screen. I used to be able to do this way, way back in the old days, in the early days of, um, of uh, PC-DOS, MS-DOS. It allowed you to um, get directly at the dots on the screen. From a, uh, an operating system point of view, this was a very, very bad idea because what it in effect did was allow you to get directly at any of your memory. And if your program was not properly written and it sort of blew up, you'd have to reboot your computer. And any properly designed computer today is built in such a way that it doesn't matter what you do, what dumb, stupid, asinine thing you manage to pull off, you cannot bring down the operating system. Unfortunately, um, sometimes it's still possible to bring down the operating system, but uh, not, not in the very easy way that it was. So by making computers uh, foolproof, or almost foolproof, um, they made it very difficult to do what once was very easy to do. Uh, unfortunately, back in the days of MS-DOS and 5 megahertz computers, uh, they were nowhere near fast enough to do what I wanted to do then. They're fast enough now, but uh, we've got this interface problem. In any event, uh, there is this phenomenon that occurs when we've got energy traveling in both directions at once called a standing wave and uh, associated with that we have what's known as a standing wave ratio and the standing wave ratio is the ratio between the voltage of the between the two voltages, the, re, the, the incident wave and the reflected wave. Uh, if there is a perfect match and no energy is reflected, the ratio is just simply going to be one to one. There is no reflected wave. Uh, if the reflected wave happens to be half as much as the incident wave, that is half the energy is reflected, then you'll have a ratio of two to one. However, if you have either a short circuit or an open circuit up here by just throwing the antenna away, all of the energy is reflected and you end up with a standing wave ratio of infinity. Not good for your transmitter at all. Uh, it'll cook it every time unless it uh, has protective circuitry that can um, react very, very quickly. There's a few really good uh, transceivers that will do that. Um, uh, it's just possible that my K3 will do it, but I'm not going to try to find out <laughs> because the, the consequences are just, uh, are just, um, just not good.
this this is another um, very interesting topic. Um, I'm not going to answer your question, but I will if I find enough time, or I I will if you stick around. <laughs> um, the uh, the way to measure the way to find out how much standing wave ratio you've got is to use an SWR bridge, a standing wave ratio bridge, and this is where it's normally placed. Notice that it's between the receiver and the matching network. That's something that's quite important to note. What it has is detectors in the line to detect the amount of forward power and also the amount of reflected power, and it can do that simultaneously at any time that there's power flowing through the system. And um, then uh, electronic circuitry to convert those two things into the standing wave ratio and to display it on some kind of display. The most common display is just simply a, uh, a meter with a, uh, a needle. But um, so, some of them, some of the newer ones nowadays uh, use um, linear displays of uh, light emitting diodes. And the reason I drew this this particular way is that with many transceivers today, the matching network, which is often called an antenna tuner, in fact, is usually called an antenna tuner. It does not tune the antenna at all, in spite of its name. With many modern transceivers, both of these components are built right into the transceiver. That's why the, the dotted line here. Uh, and the inner dotted line, the bridge and the matching network, or rather the, the SWR bridge and its indicator, are typically built into the matching network, but they don't they don't have to be. It's rather interesting that my station um, I have a, a setup where both of these are separate and the the SWR bridge is a quite a modern um, automatic one uh, built by the Elecraft people that does use diodes and um, uh, is actually auto switching as far as power is concerned. Uh, very, very handy if you want to switch from uh, low power, say QRP, to ordinary power. Mind you, they, they, you know, they don't sell those things for pocket change. I think this one costs uh, pretty close to three hundred dollars, but I really like it. But um, it is very common these days to put all of this inside the transceiver. An important thing to realize is the placement of the SWR bridge. This matching network does not, and I repeat and emphasize, does not change the standing wave ratio between the matching network and the antenna. If it happens to be 50 to 1, that's where it stays. But it does provide a match for the transceiver so that there is no reflected energy. Get, remember, if it, you know, if it reflects everything back up, none of it's going to get here down into your transceiver. So when the SWR bridge tells you you've got a standing, ratio, standing wave ratio of 1 to 1, it only exists on the bottom side, on the inside of the matching network not up here. And very, very few people understand that. Over and over again I hear people talking on the air about their antenna system is flat, meaning that it's, you know, standing wave ratio is one to one throughout the band. They just simply don't know what they're talking about. But there's no point in getting on the air and telling them they don't know what they're talking about. All you do is make yourself an enemy that way. So you, you know, yeah, you just let them have things their own way. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. At the same time, of course, the, um, the, 
the, the matching network does end up reflecting all that power that was originally reflected down back up again. So uh, the, the only real problem is that, uh, you know, on every trip back and forth, there is some loss because all transmission lines have some loss. But if you're going to be dealing with a, uh, a situation where you've got a high standing wave ratio, meaning that you've got a lot of reflected power, the obvious thing to use is the transmission line that itself has the lowest loss. And um, typically, ladder line has a loss of expressed in decibels of only about one tenth of that of coaxial cable. Radiation, radiation. From coaxial cable, there is no radiation. There's no radiation because this shield, this, remember, I've, I've you know, expanded it. Uh, this is not to scale. Um, but I expanded it because of something else I wanted to mention. This provides a shield around the, um, the inner conductor, and there's, there's no radiation from a coaxial cable in a properly matched circumstance. And a way to achieve that uh, is by doing something like this. But remember that if this is coaxial cable that's being used up here, um, you really do not have a properly matched condition here. And there is a possibility you might get quite a lot of radiation from the coaxial cable. The ladder line, what happened to my ladder line? Oh, here it is. As with all circumstances where you're dealing with alternating current, the currents in these two conductors are always flowing in opposite directions. I think it's fairly obvious from that that the electromagnetic field that's generated from each of those conductors is canceled by the current flowing in the opposite direction in the other one. Now, in order for that cancellation to be absolutely complete, the two conductors would have to be coincident, you know, in the same place, which of course is not possible. But with the conductors fairly close together, as they are here, yes, there is a, an imbalance in the radiated field close in. Um, 100 feet away. What's the difference between the field radiated from these two that are only approximately one inch apart? Insignificant. So in terms of the big picture, this stuff doesn't radiate. You wouldn't bury that, would you? No, absolutely not. Coaxial cable, yes. Uh, that is good waterproof coaxial cable. In fact, you can bury any coaxial cable, but eventually the cheap stuff will give you trouble. The good waterproof stuff, you could leave it underwater for years. No, but it's surprising uh, how well this sort of thing can work. Um, a, win a couple of winters ago, uh, I had a piece of my ladder line uh, come um, unstuck from a support and uh, a piece of my ladder line uh, ended up on the ground. In fact, it even ended up with uh, three or four inches of snow on top of it. And I, I noticed that my standing wave ratio was uh, rather higher than ordinary, but I was still able to, you know, I was still able to make contact with people and all the rest of it. Uh, but I wasn't all, considering that things didn't seem to be just quite right, I was not surprised to discover that a piece of my ladder line was laying on the ground under about yay much of snow. Well, maybe that much. How do you terminate that at the transmitter? Hmm? How do you terminate that at the... What you, what? Oh, um, well, there's no such thing as a coaxial connector that's no, no. made for these. Um, ordinarily, for transmitters, 
um, that are designed for this sort of thing, there will be two binding posts on the back. Now, in my case, I'm using a tuner, a matching network, um, that was made by the E.F. Johnson Company uh, way, way, way back 50 years ago, I guess. One of the best matching networks that was ever made. Uh, but it's designed to be used with parallel wire line of, of any type. Its input at the bottom is coaxial. So within my station confines, I just have a piece of coaxial cable joining the two, but it has binding posts at the uh, output. Now for convenience, what I've done is attached to the binding posts uh, female banana connectors um, on, um, on um, ring terminals. Okay. Ring terminals, that is the, the uh, it, it, they, they just slip over the, uh, the, the screw and you tighten down the nut. Okay. And the other end is a female banana. And I, uh, I put um, uh, banana plugs on the, uh, on, the, on the two conductors at the end. And this makes it possible for me to just simply disconnect it uh, very quickly and easily. No problem. And by the way, it's a lot cheaper than a coaxial connector, too. The very, very t good top quality end connectors made in North America today probably cost about $50. In other words, this connector, this one I got from Radio Works. Uh, about 20 years ago. This is an, a, um, a male end connector. Uh, I see that I, uh, I got that for a mere uh, $4.64. Uh, but it's uh, uh, probably made in China. Um, and it's not silver plated. A good North American made end connector like this today. Silver I expect would be about $50. Very excellent connector. Uh, incidentally, the, uh, you know, this with the military grade end connectors on the end of these, these connectors would be in that category. Made in America, 50 bucks, I suspect. <laughs> I think I saw somebody looking at my cable. Uh, I see only one thing on my little list here. Uh, one thing left. Hey, the timing is fantastic, isn't it? Um, I have something to say about that also. Um, what I've talked about here almost exclusively is a dipole antenna as normally used for the HF frequencies between 3 and 30 megahertz and the, the IC questions about transmission lines focus on that uh, particular um, situation as well. But another antenna that's very commonly used is a vertical antenna. Now, a vertical antenna is actually a monopole antenna. It's just half a dipole mounted vertically, and a proper vertical monopole has a ground plane underneath it. Those, that ground plane is normally achieved by using radials. And as you might expect, the characteristic impedance for that would be half that for a dipole. And in fact, it is. It's around 36 ohms. Well, there's no coaxial cable made that's 36 ohms that I've ever heard of. But um, it, there's no problem uh, about using this sort of thing because Vertical antenna is normally just a piece of pipe, a metal conductor of some kind, and 
here's the ground underneath it. And if, if it happens to be a, a quarter wavelength, the dipole is a half a wavelength. If it happens to be a quarter wavelength, it makes it a perfect monopole with an impedance at the base of about 35 ohms. All you need to do to get it to match is to put some better leave myself some extra room, this certainly can't be the scale, is to put an inductor in here to make up for the, um, uh, the loss of, um, to give it extra impedance. And that will be connected to the center conductor of your coaxial cable, and the sheath just connected to your ground plane, your, your radial system. That's the, the most common way to feed a vertical antenna. Um, with any kind of antenna, including this, actually the best place, best place to put your matching network is right up here at the antenna itself. But that, that causes a big problem because you can only get a perfect match at one frequency. You start shifting around frequencies, or worse still, shift to a different amateur band, you need to make a radical change in the adjustment of this. How on earth are you going to do that with this thing hanging from your antenna up there 35 feet in the sky? You'd have to get one for each antenna. Eh? Well, it, it, uh, like I said, the, you can only get a perfect match at one frequency, but even moving around at different frequencies within the same band, you're still in trouble. Um, in fact, you can be in very serious trouble. So, um, what you can do, and what a few people have done, is provide a support for the middle of your antenna. Typically, dipole antennas are supported by two poles at an appropriate distance apart. Um, often, the two poles are actually provided by Mother Nature, and they're called trees. And um, uh, probably the majority of amateurs have their antennas strung between two trees. Uh, my first antenna was strung between two maple trees. Uh, in each case, um, I climbed as far up in the tree as I could get. Fortunately, never fell down, and uh, that was my antenna. Uh, at the present time, I'm using a couple of masts. But if you want anything heavy at the center of the antenna, well, you know, if you put something heavy and it's only supported at each end, it's going to drag the center of the antenna halfway down to the ground, and that it's not a good thing. You want it, your antenna to be as high as possible. So if you provide a center support for your antenna, then there is an easy solution. You can buy automatic antenna tuners. And uh, if you have a support for them, then you can mount your automatic antenna tuner right up there uh, on the mast, right at the antenna feed point, and everything is taken care of. However, automatic antenna tuners, uh, which are in weatherproof enclosures, are quite expensive. So um, you don't gain all that much. It's, it's really not worth it unless you, well, you're a contester, for instance, and you know you want to uh, get absolute maximum efficiency. But it's no problem with the vertical antenna. The vertical antenna, the feed point is right down at the ground, and um, you'd still uh, want to use an automatic tuner here because this is outdoors, but uh, it's at a place where you can easily get at it to uh, fix it or whatever you need to do. And th this is quite commonly done. That is to use an automatic tuner, an automatic net, uh, automatic um, matching network here at the feed point. 
Um, I'd say it's relatively common, but only by those that have uh, lots of resources. For, for most, most folk, uh, they, they just simply do what I have done here and put up with um, a certain amount of standing wave ratio on their transmission line and use a matching network uh, inside the station itself. Oh, yes, yes. I wanted to say something about this, something important. Uh, I said this is not the scale. Uh, actually, the size of the center conductor is, is much larger than normal. And uh, certainly, the, the size of the sheath is much more than normal. What I've uh, shaded in as green is intended to be the conductor, which typically is going to be copper. And uh, a very interesting and important effect takes place at radio frequencies in conductors. It's known as skin effect. In any conductor at radio frequencies, the current, the RF current, flows only in a narrow layer of the conductor beneath the surface. That's what I intend to display by this red shading here. And even though that, that sheath that coaxial sheath is, is very thin um, for all of the coaxial cables I've shown here it would typically be much less than a millimeter maybe as little as a tenth but at radio frequencies that's still very very thick so it's possible in any coaxial cable for different radio frequency currents to flow the inside surface and also near the outside surface and for those currents to be totally independent. So totally independent it's the same thing as though an insulating layer may have been placed between the two. It would be possible to actually manufacture a conductor that would do that sort of thing but uh, why anybody would want to do it I don't know. Uh, at radio frequencies, the, the nature of the beast itself uh, does that for you. There's an important consequence of this when it comes to feeding a... That's what I'm looking for, a brush. Supposing you had a, an antenna like this it's not balanced. These things are relatively common and they're called off-center dipoles, off-center fed dipoles. There, there are some advantages of, of, of doing this sort of thing. So if we attach a coaxial cable directly to an antenna like this, we're going to have the center conductor going to one side of the antenna and the sheath going to the other. Because the dipole is unbalanced, there's not perfect balance. Let me extend this a little more so it's more obvious. The, these two currents will not be the same. So, Within the coaxial cable itself, the current flowing in the center conductor and the current flowing on the inner surface of the shield have to be the same. It's, it's, it's the nature of the beast. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a constant exchange of energy between the two inside a coaxial cable. So if these external currents are different and the currents within the coaxial cable are restricted to being the same, 
This forces some of the RF energy, the excess or, or lack of it, to flow along the outer surface of the coaxial cable. That is this current I've illustrated here. That current flowing on the outside surface of the coaxial cable will radiate. And this can cause big time trouble, and often does. That can be prevented by using what's known as a choke ballon. A choke ballon really is nothing more than a ferrite, a big ferrite bead placed around the antenna at this right, you know, right at the top of the coax. This choke ballon will not allow current to flow on the outside. This will not allow current to flow on the outside. The nature of the coaxial cable itself will not allow imbalanced currents to flow on the inside. What that means is that that forces these antenna currents that want to be unbalanced, it forces them to be balanced. There will, there will be a loss of efficiency because of this effect, but what it will do is prevent the radiation from a current flowing on the near the outside surface of the coax. This is a very, very common problem, actually, and I'm afraid most people don't understand it. And that's how it that can like, happen and does happen. Is that like power supplies and audio cables have? The, uh, they often have that thing on the outside of the cable? Um, well, yes and no. Um, More than anything, you're probably thinking of computer cables, cables for um, uh, monitors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is to prevent radiation in in that particular instance, um, because uh, uh, well, most of those cables are shielded, and uh, even though they're I was going to say, even though they're not radio frequency, but they, they can be at, at, at fairly high frequencies, actually. And basically, yes, you're right. It, uh, it serves the same purpose, to choke off any current that flows along the, w would flow along the outside surface of that shield. And uh, at a radio amateur station, that can often be very, very serious. Uh, there have been times in the past when uh, the, the, the hash coming from computer cables uh, has made uh, reception on some amateur frequencies almost impossible. But I, I've noticed that uh, in recent times uh, the vast majority of these computer cables uh, do have ferrite chokes on uh, often both ends of the cable. It can't do anything but good and does. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, another way of achieving the same effect here is just simply with a coil of, uh, oh, say, five or six turns, five or, you know, a loop of five or six turns of coaxial cable uh, will, will serve the same purpose. As a matter of fact, there was a beam made by Cushcraft, I think, a 40 meter beam um, that actually used a coil. It, it was visible in the photographs. I don't think there were. I don't think there were more than maybe about two turns. But you, you obviously remember seeing those photographs. Yeah. Well, that was it. It was a basically a choke ballon, a different kind of choke ballon that just used some coaxial cable. That's it. Okay. What was that question you had? Ballon, uh, the dummy load. Ah, uh, oh, the dummy, that's right, yeah, yeah. Um, you 
I often hear people say on the air that people should tune up with a dummy load, and in fact, there are there are some questions in the in the um, in the uh, in the IC question the inner the <laughs> industry Canada pool question pool about this that tells you you should tune up into a dummy load. This is only useful if you're actually testing the transmitter. It's virtually useless uh, when you're dealing with tuning up because with a dummy load, you're tuning up into a 50 ohm load. And with the typical antenna, you're not tuning up into a, a, a perfect match at all. You're, you're, you're getting your match by virtue of the matching network. And sure, you can tune your, your, um, uh, your transmitter up into the dummy load. Well, with modern transmitters, you don't even need to. In, in older days, uh, with vacuum tubes, uh, typically there were uh, sometimes maybe as many as half a dozen different tuning controls on the front of your transmitter. You needed to get your tuning, your transmitter tuned up. Because of the low impedances that are involved in uh, solid state um, devices, it's possible uh, to build transmitters with no tuning controls on them, whatever, other than the you know the the one major tuning control. So uh, these transmitters just simply don't need to be tuned up at all. And um, while uh, having a dummy load on hand is a jolly good idea, I've got three of them um, to actually tune up on the air. They're they're useless. You've got to tune up into your uh, antenna system anyway. So uh, with, a, with one of the modern solid state transceivers, um, you got dummy load? Sell it to somebody. 